Well, I hope everybody has their water bottles and their energy gels because today we're training for a marathon. <laughs> Greetings and welcome to our second history lecture uh, in this distance learning experiment, our second history lecture offered on the interwebs. Uh, so we are continuing with the story of classical Greece uh, and classical Athens and Sparta during their golden age. Uh, and today I am introducing the Greco-Persian Wars. So this is the first of two planned lectures on the Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, and the first, we're going to be looking into the origins uh, all the way up to the Battle of Marathon uh, and its importance. So if you remember uh, from when we were in school uh, physically on campus, uh, as we talked about, you know, the study of history and how we study history, uh, the study of history is largely based on asking questions and asking the right questions. Uh, and here, the question we want to start with is why? Why would a few, and remember, it's not all of Greece, it's a few Greek city-states, why would a few Greek city-states take on the mighty Persian Empire, the largest empire the world had ever seen up to that point? Uh, it's madness. I mean, you, you have to think about the Athenian assembly voting to go to war with Persia, this is before Marathon. This is before they knew how it would turn out. This must have seemed like madness uh, to many Athenians. This is, think of what if Andorra decided to go to war with the United States, uh, to, to go to war with the great king uh, and all the, the thousands and tens of thousands of troops he could muster uh, even for a small military expedition. So here we are looking at the why of the Greco-Persian War uh, and a little bit uh, of the significance of the why it matters. Uh, if you remember my favorite question, so what? Uh, what does the Greco-Persian War mean to us uh, living here and now uh, in uh, 2020? So if you remember back, uh, back uh, when we were covering our unit on the ancient Near East, we concluded uh, that unit with the Persian Empire, uh, sort of the last of the great ancient Near East empires uh, that, that we were going to study this year. It's a relatively young empire. Uh, it, it's founding under Cyrus the Great, uh, happening in the mid 500s BC. Uh, and the, the mighty Persian Empire at its height, uh, so it's not just Cyrus, it is uh, some of the great kings who came after him as well. Uh, when the Persians are coming uh, into contact with and beginning to clash with the Greeks, uh, it's immense, it's huge. Uh, take a look at a modern map. Uh, the Persian Empire, the borders of the Persian Empire stretch all the way from modern day Pakistan in the east to Egypt in the west. And from uh, the borderlands of Egypt and Sudan in the south to modern day Bulgaria in the north. And Persian military expeditions had even made it past Bulgaria, past the Danube. Uh, they had crossed the Danube and into modern day Ukraine and all the way to southern Russia. Uh, when they were trying to subdue the Scythians. And so this empire is, is immense and diverse uh, and powerful. Uh, and they had only just started in the mid uh, to late 500s coming into contact with Greece. So if you remember uh, the barrier between the Greeks uh, who aren't just living in mainland Greece, uh, they've established city-states uh, all around the coast of the Aegean Sea uh, and into that region of modern-day Western Turkey, the, the modern-day Western Turkish uh, coast of Ionia, that there are some very important Greek city-states in the region of Ionia. Uh, and this went back well into the Dark Ages. Uh, the buffer zone between them and Persia was the kingdom of Lydia. And you remember from Herodotus that Croesus of Lydia uh, 
de was debating whether or not to fight the Persians. He, he sent to the oracle at Delphi and asked the question, what's going to happen if I fight the Persians? And the answer was, you know, if you attack the Persians, a great empire will fall. And Croesus um, forgot the lesson of the importance of asking follow-up questions, such as, which empire would that be? There's two involved here. Uh, and he attacked the Persians, and the Persians won, and Herodotus's story is that, you know, Croesus is there uh, on the bonfire tied to the stake, about to be burned to death, thinking, oh, wait a minute, I'm the great empire. Oops. So Lydia falls, and with it, the Greek city-states of Ionia. And so one thing that's going on here is the Persians are now not just in contact with uh, Greek-speaking peoples, but they are ruling some Greeks. Uh, and the way that the Persians rule Ionia is uh, really the, very similar to how they rule elsewhere uh, through local tyrants. Uh, so you get a in Miletus or Ephesus uh, or wherever you are or Sardis, you have a, uh, you have a local family that they, they'd like to be the leader, they, they want to be the tyrant, and so they collaborate with the Persian Empire, uh, prove their loyalty to the Persian Empire, and the Persians support uh, the local guy as the tyrant ruling Miletus or ruling Ephesus. Uh, the, the problem here is that we're heading towards the end of the 500s. We're heading into the 400s, this is when mainland Greece has overthrown its tyrannies. That, that, that tyranny as a way of government is a thing of the past. And in these Greek city-states in Ionia, uh, they also are tired of tyrants. They don't want these tyrants. And that translates into hostility uh, also towards outside Persian rule. So Ionia, Greek Ionia, is ripe for revolt, is ripe for rebellion against the Persians. But they need help. So that's one thing that's going on. One thing that's going on is uh, the Greeks of Ionia want to rebel against Persian rule anyway. This is just a powder keg waiting for a match. That, that's the first thing. That's, that's the first cause. Secondly, What's going on in Athens? What is going on in Athens? So if you remember 508 uh, BC, we talked in the last lecture about this, we get this democratic revolution in Athens uh, under Cleisthenes. Now, democracy, even if they're not calling it that yet, they're calling it isegoria or equality of speech, but democracy is not that popular with a lot of Greek city-states. A lot of Greek city-states, uh, and we will definitely see this with Sparta next week, see democracy as a threat, especially as Athens uh, will build a desire to spread democracy and to spread their own influence throughout the Greek-speaking world. And a lot of ancient authors aren't very fond of democracy either. We get, you know, if you read someone like Plato, you, you, re, you read a lot of critics of democracy. Uh, Herodotus is a supporter. Herodotus's history is, is largely in praise of Athenian democracy. Uh, and, and so the, the, the rest of Greece, uh, much of the rest of Greece sees Athenian democracy as a threat and they would like to put it down. They would like to see Athens under an oligarchy again. And so Athens is looking at the prospect as we're heading from 508 into 507 BC uh, of war with its neighbors. And Athens, uh, the Athenians don't know how this is going to go. They're looking for help. They're looking for friends. And they're thinking, if you're looking for friends, why not go with the most powerful land empire on earth? Why not send an embassy to, to Persia and see if they will help us? And so these Athenian ambassadors go to the Persian uh, capital of Lydia, Sardis, uh, to seek help from the Persians. And the Persian satrap in Sardis uh, demands that if they're going to come talk to him, if, the, if he's going to, going to receive these Athenian ambassadors, they must bring an offering to the great king of earth and water. Earth and water, the Zoroastrian symbol for the land 
and everything that comes with it, everything that comes from it. An offering of earth and water to the great king of Persia is a sign of your total submission to him. He is now your ruler, and the negotiations that will follow are the negotiations of how that relationship of him ruling you is going to be worked out. The Persian emperor doesn't really have a concept of dealing with other countries as, you know, equal, friendly nations. Either you're a subject or you are not. And these Athenian ambassadors make their offering of earth and water, but in the meantime, the uh, Athenian uh, army, the Athenian phalanx has won their war and Athenian democracy survives and Athens is free and independent and they don't need help from Persia after all. And the ambassadors come home basically to be scolded, to be asked, what, what are you thinking? We didn't, who told you to offer earth and water? We're not submitting to the Persian empire and we don't need them anymore anyway. Uh, so now you have this history going on. You have in the mind of uh, the Persian great king, uh, if he thinks about Athens at all, if he's even aware of what is to him this insignificant little city-state that they're not even worth conquering, what do you get if you take Athens anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Um, if he does think about them, though, it's these liars. They came, they submitted, they offered earth and water, and they took it back. And, and truth really matters to the Persians. And so you have, you have this tension going on, that Athens betrays their promises. Oh, but, but in the Persian, in, in the eyes of the Persians, it gets worse. It gets much worse than that. So those two things are going on. Those two things are going on here. So, you know, the Persian Empire has spread. The Persian Empire is, is ruling Ionia uh, to Greeks on the mainland. And, you know, how do you feel about uh, what had been independent Greek cities now under someone else's rule, especially in a place as culturally uh, important to the Greeks as Ionia? Remember, this is the home of the pre-Socratic philosophers. Uh, this is where Thales of Miletus is from. Uh, this is where Heraclitus is from. Remember my favorite pre-Socratic uh, philosopher, the, the guy who said, uh, you never step in the same river twice. You know, think about it. Uh, and, we're, and Ionia is on the verge of revolt. And then um, in 499, 499 BC, uh, spearheaded by Miletus, uh, the Greek city-states of Ionia are ready to rise in revolt against the Persians. They need help. And so Miletus you know, sends out for help uh, to the Greek mainland. And most of Greece says, thanks but no thanks. Most of Greece says, we're not touching war with Sparta, I mean, war with uh, Persia with a 10-foot pole. Uh, speaking of Sparta, there, there's a reason for that slip of the tongue. Uh, they, they go to Sparta, and Sparta says, no way, no how. King Cleomenes of Sparta says, absolutely not. Remember how reluctant Sparta is to send its army outside its own borders? Uh, well, this is across the Aegean Sea all the way into, into Asia Minor. Uh, there's no way. But they come to Athens, and Athens is really thinking about it because uh, something else is going on. Uh, the relationship with Persia, already tense, has gotten even more complicated. Uh, remember, Athens had overthrown its last tyrant, Hippias, and Hippias fled to Persia. Uh, and so what the Persians would like to do, the new Persian great king, Darius I, Who's, who's in a very shaky position. Darius I was not the heir to the throne. He was a usurper, and he's facing rebellion uh, throughout his empire, and Egypt is always on the verge of rebellion against the Persians, uh, and he's, he's looking for ways to uh, cement, to solidify his rule uh, and, and expand his empire. Uh, one thing he's thinking is we could take Hippias, and send him back to Athens, get the Athenians to accept him, to submit to us, and Hippias would be a Persian satrap over Athens. Uh, and, and so Hippias is, is 
with the Persians, plotting his return to Athens. The Athenians know this, and they send another em embassy uh, to Sardis, saying, hey, could you guys... You know, could you be a pal and, uh, you know, to the Persian great king, could you be a pal and not uh, send Hippias to rule our city again? Could we just kind of get along and agree to disagree on that whole earth and water thing from earlier? And the Persians say, no, we want your submission. Keep your promises, people. Uh, and so the Athenians are now really uh, seeing the Persians as enemies anyway. Add to that that the Ionian rebels, the Ionian city-states, uh, their first act of rebellion against the Persians is to overthrow their Persian-supported tyrants and establish democracies. And so there's also a sense in Athens of, these are our boys! It's our, it's our fellow, go team democracy! We need to help them! And so the Athenian assembly votes to send a fleet of 20 triremes, of 20 of their state-of-the-art warships, as Athens is already thinking about starting a navy uh, to get ready to fight the Persians. And so this, this Athenian fleet, with the help of another small city-state of uh, Eritrea on the northern end of uh, the island of, uh, of uh, Eubea, they go to go. They go to help the Ionian rebels to fight the Persians, and this Athenian force, uh, this Eritrean force, with their Ionian allies. Uh, so this is, you know, the, the Ionian revolt starts in 499 BC. Uh, they land. They march on Sardis. They march on the Persian capital of Lydia. And they take about half the city. They're fighting uh, with the Persians over the city of Sardis, and fire breaks out in the middle of the fighting, and in the midst of this fire, the temple burns down. And the, the Persian uh, conclusion from this is the Athenians burn down the temple. Not only are the Athenians dirty, rotten liars who don't keep their promises, uh, you know, they give you earth and water, and then they take it back, they burned down temples, too. We've got to do something about these Athenians. Uh, the Persians counterattack. The Persians bounce back. It turns out not to be the easy war that the Ionians had promised uh, Athens. Uh, Athens pulls out of the war after being defeated by a Persian army uh, at Ephesus. Uh, and with the Athenians gone, the Ionians can't hold out. And by 494, the Persians put down the Ionian revolt. Uh, the, the war ends with the Persians uh, capturing, uh, capturing Miletus, burning it to the ground, killing the men, enslaving the women and children, uh, deporting any survivors to other parts of the Persian Empire. Uh, and now the Persians want revenge. Uh, the story from Herodotus, uh, the story from Herodotus is that uh, upon hearing the news of the burning of the temple at Sardis, upon encountering this, this warfare with a people he really had not heard of, Darius of Persia, uh, here's how he responds to uh, the Athenians helping the Ionian rebels and burning part of Sardis. There we go. News was brought to Darius that Sardis had been taken and burnt by the Athenians and Ionians, and that the prime mover in the joint enterprise was Aristagoras of Miletus. The story goes that when Darius learnt of the disaster, he did not give a thought to the Ionians, knowing perfectly well that the punishment for their revolt would come. But he asked who the Athenians were, and then, on being told, called for his bow. He took it, set an arrow on the string, shot it up into the air, and cried, Grant, O God, that I may punish the Athenians. Then he commanded one of his servants to repeat to him the words, Master, remember the Athenians, three times whenever he sat down to dinner. You can't be the ruler of a great empire 
and lose a battle to a small city-state. You have to restore your honor with conquest. And so in 491, Darius sends his ambassadors throughout Greece to demand offerings of earth and water. The story is that both the Spartans and Athenians had a unique response to these ambassadors, that the Spartans uh, pushed them down a well, that the Athenians shoved them off a cliff, saying, you, you can get your earth and water down there. Uh, plenty of earth and water. Dig it out for yourself when you hit the bottom. That comes from Herodotus. As Darius prepares a great fleet to teach the Athenians a lesson. And that brings us up to the Battle of Marathon. Um, I, I've, gone, I've gone a bit longer than I thought I would, so I'm actually going to cover the run-up to the Battle of Marathon in the next lesson. What is going to ensue, though, is a political debate in Athens. Is it madness to fight the Persians? Do we need to negotiate? Uh, some in Athens would be perfectly happy to accept Hippias back. The Persian plan is not to burn Athens. It's not to enslave the Athenians. It's to get them to submit and accept Hippias as their, as their tyrant once again. Um, others say, well, let's let the Persians in. Let's let them land and they can march around a bit and we'll just stay behind our walls. The other response is no. We are going to fight them at the beach. We are going to stop them before they enter. That is the point of view of the majority of the assembly. That is what uh, the symbol of Athenian democracy is going to, to, to go for. That's where the vote will go. And the fact that the Athenians win the Battle of Marathon is seen as a great vindication of democracy. Look, this is what a free people can do when they decide to stand up for their rights. This is where I'm going to close this lecture. Uh, the next lecture will begin with the Battle of Marathon itself. So make sure you're keeping up with those trainings.